Greetings and hello to everyone. This is the Business of Betting podcast and I'm your host, Jake Williams. Today is episode 39 and we have Dean Evans joining the show. Dean, aka The Trial Spy, has been an enormously successful horse racing analyst and service provider based on his innovative and revolutionary approach to form assessment. We chat about investing principles, money management, bank preservation, how to watch trials, the tipping industry, and the guiding principles for winning edge investments. This podcast is proudly sponsored by Betfair. Betfair operates a betting exchange and is licensed in the Northern Territory of Australia. Residents of Australia can join Betfair by visiting betfair.com.au and support this podcast by using promo code BOBPOD. Please gamble responsibly. As always, you can find us at businessofbetting.com or at bettingpod on Twitter. Please fire in any questions or feedback and potential guests you would like to hear from. So thank you for listening and I hope you enjoy my chat with Dean Evans. Today I'm joined by Dean Evans from Winning Edge Investments. Dean, thank you very much for joining me. No worries, Jake. Thank you very much for having me on. So let's get straight into it, Dean. What's sort of your background and history in horse racing and betting? Uh, well, I think I think my love of, of racing, uh, you know, came from my father. He bred uh, a number of horses um, in New Zealand and Australia. Uh, sort of had had some black type success and a few, uh, you know, reasonably handy horses. Um, and used to love, you know, heading out to the track, both uh, in New Zealand, where I'm originally from, and, and in Australia, and uh, and just going and watching them. And I guess uh, from there, you know, I've always had a, a sort of a mathematical background and uh, and been good in that sort of area. So uh, it sort of developed, I suppose, from enjoying betting, um, and I think uh, you know enjoying the racing firstly, but. Uh, I think getting to a point where you know when you when you're watching something you enjoy so often you know yeah you know, the, the betting's a, a fairly uh, uh, integral part of uh, of the racing game and and so I used to uh, do that and I can recall sort of doing it probably from about age ten on my on my dad's uh, betting account you know trying to trying to pretend with the deep voice yeah yep. you know calling up the TAB and <laughs> trying to get things on <laughs> you know I can recall when I was about thirteen or fourteen. Uh, uh, watching a particular race, it was on a you know a, a bog heavy track, and 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 you know doing the form and seeing that there were only three horses that could handle the heavy, and everything else just couldn't. Uh, boxing those three up and getting a, a trifecta, you know, only cost me six dollars and, and and won about eight grand. And I think sort of about then was when I it sort of PK'd my interest. You know, as a kid, that's a, a truckload of money, and and I, I suppose I sort of you know, twigged in my head that, oh, hang on, you know, if you do a bit of research and, and you know what you're doing, you can you can do something out of this. But, you know, having said that, I, I still sort of went through uh, my early years finding a lot of winners and, and certainly backing a lot of big price winners and, and that sort of thing and, and knowing that I could uh, beat the market, but still not winning overall. And so it was, it was really, I suppose, a situation where I knew this was a passion. Uh, I knew that I love racing and I knew... I suppose that I'd always want to bet on racing, but being the type of person that I am, I decided, you know, I was I was losing. I'm, I'm also the sort of person that doesn't want to lose money, so I decided rather than quitting, I, I wanted to educate myself on how to become, you know, a prof- profitable and successful punter. And so that meant reading a lot of books, reading a lot of, uh, you know, doing a lot of investigation on the web, um, and I even, you know, started following certain services. And I guess, you know, t- turn myself from a, a losing punter to one that was, uh, you know, winning very handsomely. Went through the same process, I suppose, as a lot. With winning comes uh, getting banned. And, and so, you know, I got to a position where I was banned from uh, most bookies in Australia. And and that, that came from developing an edge a few years ago around trials. And so I was watching a lot of trials. And, and all I was really doing was... You know, chucking them, chucking them in a black book. And any any horse that I'd, I'd seen trial well, in particular, I like to focus on maidens and young horses. And and you know, as as still happens today, maidens and young horses were, were trialing up against open class horses, or you know, horses that won a few races and, and jog trotting next to them while they're under hard riding. Uh, and, and back then, a few years ago, that was just a, an absolute gold mine. It was it was uh, quite unbelievable that, that no one was watching the trials. Uh, you have know, horses going out at big odds who you just knew uh, had panels on the field. And from that, I, I built an association with, with Champion, released a, a service called Trial Spy um, that, that was incredibly successful. 
and you know still is we've been doing that for about five years and generated around uh, 600 units profit you know, around 10 percent profit on turnover and it's, it's just been an incredibly successful service we only able to do one and take a, for a few days a, a year and then we, we close it up because it's uh, you know been so popular and 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 I suppose we, we haven't had uh, you know many drop offs so it's um you know shown that 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 edge uh, it was enormous it's it's certainly different now uh, there's a lot more watching it you know I know and talking to, to friends and acquaintances who have, uh, you know work for bookies and that sort of thing they they cottoned on after I started doing webinars you know to, to large uh, large groups that um uh onto the trial game you know it's very different now if, if there's a horse that trials well regardless of its form you know the bookies keep it keep it tighter than they used to where they used to you know ignore or, or not uh not sort of place as much um impetus on the trial form so so sort of kicked that off and 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 at the same time was was doing some sort of non-trial related you know form assessment as well so that resulted in uh, running another service uh, uh and, and both those services still run today so I want to run through a hypothetical scenario with you. Before you were with Champion and you were winning based off your you know, trial form as well as sort of typical handicapping, how much do you think a corporate bookmaker should have paid you for that information? And where I'm coming from is you know, instead of banning you, there's obviously a value in you winning long term and them having access to that information. What do you think it was worth to a individual corporate bookmaker to essentially accept a certain level of your bets to have access to that information well some of that some of them did do that and some of them still do that okay there's some there's some, still some bookies that that'll let me bet and, and you know obviously we've had the, the minimum bet laws come in and yep. most of them most of them have, have let me bet. some still don't abide but uh, i give up after a while trying to trying to force them but um you know, some some of them still did. Yeah, you know, from my perspective, that was okay to get a little bit on, but it was it was nothing much. Yeah. And you know, because as soon as I'd place a bet, you know, it'd, it'd smash those odds in for that bookie. Uh, you know, because I'm running services, I'd uh, you know try to avoid that as well. And 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 uh, you know, got to a point where I was tra- having to get most of my bets on late. You know, just so that I would allow members, you know, the, the opportunity to to get in there early. You know, they certainly did. But yeah, uh, we did some really basic maths on you know, back in the early days of, of Trial Spy. Everybody had a Bet365 account. They weren't actually banning people. They were betting you, you know, the best tote guarantee. And, you know, we would have pulled millions from them as a as a group. Wow. You know, even on your most conservative sort of estimates. So it's no surprise, you know, and there was a couple of uh, periods where they just went bang and pretty much, uh, you know, restricted virtually everyone on the receiving the service because uh, they could sort of see the, the pattern, I suppose. And so, you know, you've got to adapt with that. You know, in terms of services, obviously, we, we now send everything out after 9 a.m. so that everybody can at least get on with the minimum bet laws. Uh, but also, you, you know, there's there's more of an opportunity, I think, now to you know, some can bet early, uh, some can bet late. Um, there's some good corporate products, whether you've got you know, Betfair SP and you can still set a minimum price, uh, Best Tote SP, uh, the, the global tote yeah. with, with top better also throws up some, some huge prices sometimes. You know, there, there's alternatives for people, and and there's more of a mix, I think, now of of, of clientele, which is good. That you've got some who like to bet early, some who like to bet late and monitor themselves, some who like to just, uh, you know, use one of those products that I've just spoken about. So you sort of get a mix, and there's a lot more balance now. Uh, so we don't see the the sort of, you know, the, the crazy odd movements that you, that used to occur. Let's talk price. Unlike bookies and toads, the Betfair Exchange is a low margin buy sell fixed odds marketplace where the value stays with the punter not the house. Ready for the game within the game? Join betfair.com.au. Gamble responsibly. So take us through your mindset when you decided to release your trial spy selections because from my perspective, it sounds like you could have put a group together and potentially made a lot of money out of it doing it without providing access to the public to those selections. What was the rationale to you know be able to provide that to other punters out there? Well, you know, and in hindsight, we, we probably could have done a lot, a lot better doing that. But at the, at the time, you know, I, I was um, uh, learning from from some of those involved there, and and you know, it was sort of a, a kickoff yep. for for some additional income, considering that I was in a position where I wasn't able to get anywhere near as much on as I wanted to. From there, though, what what I sort of found was I actually just really, really enjoy. The interaction side of things, um, you know, I think most most people know that betting can be a lonely game when you're sitting there in your your dungeon and and you know it's betting away on your own. 
so you know I really enjoy the interaction I enjoy the the uh, you know questions from members and 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 and, and helping them and, and it's sort of got to the point where you know with both my services now there's a you know, hundred page member information pack and, and it's basically a, a culmination of all of the questions that have come from from members and 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 you know punters wanting to learn how to how to get the best odds uh, you know how to avoid getting banned by the bookmakers um, and how to just maximize their their uh, their profits with their betting activities and you know, a lot of it is around the mindset sort of sort of, side of things as well um, and I just I enjoy that I enjoy the education side of it I enjoy helping people win uh, and that's probably the reason why I've continued to do it you know there's a lot of pleasure from getting emails from people you know telling them how much they've won you know over a period or what they've sort of done with those winnings and yeah that that's enjoyable it's incredibly fair it makes perfect sense so on this topic what are I mean you mentioned that it sounds like a manifesto what are some of winning edge investments philosophies and I guess general thoughts on the the horse racing and I guess sports betting tipping industry as a whole well I suppose you know what I what I tried to do over the time is, is just listen to what people you know wanted when it came to tipping services I think that there's a lot of you know there's a lot of good analysts out there and, and a lot of good pro punters but but it doesn't always translate to uh, necessarily having a service that that people enjoy uh, or are able to win from. You know, I think the industry as a whole has a lot of question marks around it. I, th- I think when you look at the fact that uh, a lot of tipping services can promote sort of corporate bookmaker links and, and that sort of thing, there's kind of say it's somewhat antithetical to the the aim of uh, having punters win when you're on the on the flip side actually incentivized for them to lose by uh, by virtue of you know promoting corporate bookmakers and, and getting a payment uh, based on losses uh, I think that that's one of the reasons why people have you know, a lot of question marks about you know a lot of tipping services and and their their motives and even some of the major you know tipping uh, or not tipping websites but just major horse racing websites uh, you know the pack full of very useful information and certainly get people to bet more which is a, a big positive and the information they put out in a lot of cases is uh, is good but at the end of the day they are still you know ultimately incentivized to get people to bet uh, and unfortunately incentivized to get people to lose because that is the structure of how the, the corporate affiliates work yeah in terms of you know complaints from from people that I've heard about other sites and and uh, and and generally around the industry, you know, I think results not being posted on uh, on the website regularly, meaning that they're not you know verified. Uh, some don't put them on the website at all. Some only send them if they're asked, which again, you know, I, th- I think questions the transparency, and you have really got to question the accuracy of those. I, I think too, you know, the the you've really got to focus long term with your betting, and yet uh, most seem to to trump on the, the results over a day or, or a week or a month, which again is, is, is somewhat meaningless for anyone who's looking at betting long term and, and making a genuine profit over a long period. You know, you see testimonials that are from, from members who've had a great day or a week or, uh, you know, great start. There's no clear odds recording policy, uh, so it, it's unclear how they've come up with these results and whether they're achievable. No explanation of the betting bank. I always find that interesting. Uh, there's a lot of talk about units, uh, people using units, but you know, people use units simply um, to reflect that. You know, if you, if you say one unit on a horse for one person, that might mean a hundred dollars. For another person, that might mean two hundred. For another person, that might mean five hundred. But uh, what I find interesting is how many have converted across to this units concept and yet don't actually have any clear uh, explanation of how many units you're supposed to have for the service. So, so the whole unit concept is somewhat meaningless. You know, results actually not being from when the service started, but but sort of created out of thin air somewhat. And you know, people sort of uh, you know, not having any other sort of profile, whether it be on social media or anywhere, and and, and being somewhat uh, hidden and unknown. So we sort of took a lot of the experience, I guess, that that I've uh, accumulated from 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 doing this for five years across two different services. You know, with Winning Edge. Uh, it was just all about trying to do the right things based on what uh, people wanted from a legitimate service. So, you know, making sure the results are transparent. We have seven services at the moment uh, across different horse racing genres and, and sport. Uh, you know, we make sure those results are up on the website every day. 
Uh, they've got clear summaries on the, the units profit, units invested, the profit and turnover, turnover investment, the full detailed spreadsheet with every single bet uh, and more detail than um, I believe any other services have. And we also post the, the daily and overall results uh, on Twitter and, and Facebook every single day. So, you know, we're accountable in a way that, that no other services are. Uh, there's a very transparent and clear odds recording policy. So with any service that that uh, that starts with us, you know, there's firstly a very, very long and involved and detailed process of uh, verifying the results um, and, and going through a trial period to ensure that they're, you know, uh, uh, genuine. You know, we, we recorded the third best fixed price only from a small select group of bookies who actually take a bet uh, or mid-tote. You know, it ensures clarity for members and, and non-members alike to, to critically assess and compare each service's performance. And it's stated up front, you know, a lot of services sort of make statements like, oh, if you'd done this or if you'd bet this way, you would have achieved a certain result. But the, the advice is useless if, if it's not provided before the tips are sent. So, you know, we're all about sort of fairness and, and achievability of the results recording. Uh, you know, the services are genuinely profitable uh, and people can see that daily and are verified by uh, all of the members who, who are following you know, we're real people. We're not sort of hiding behind hiding behind names or, you know, just behind a computer screen. They're, they're all people with, with uh, uh, real profiles and, and uh, you know, available publicly, um, not just behind a computer. We provide a profit guarantee with every service. So, you know, if, uh, if our service doesn't show a profit, then we re refund the next payment. Uh, and, and that just means that, again, the analysts are very much aligned with, with the customers and that, you uh, if the service isn't making a profit, then the analysts aren't getting paid. And, and again, unlike virtually every other tipping service, you know, we, we have no corporate bookmaker affiliate uh, deals, which means that uh, if the services are losing, we are not getting any income. And, yeah, we don't just tip. We educate, try to act as a full advisory uh, service, provide very clear information when the bets are sent on whether to bet immediately, whether to bet later, the exact units to have on the, the, the horse, the, the current price, uh, and, and all of the detail. And, and like I said, uh, your members get a, uh, a sort of 100-page uh, members information pack with plenty of education to help them. You know, the testimonials are from long-term members. You know, they're from people who've been with us for years and years, uh, and not for a week or two. For me, it was really just about the the, uh, the concept of really trying to make sure that everything that I've learned over, over five years of what people want uh, and how to do things in an honest and open and transparent way about the realities of, of how to succeed with your betting you know that's what's important to me is that is that people treat it like an investment and that's when we recently merged horse racing professionals and sport betting professionals into one name uh, i wanted to call it winning edge investments because you know if you look at the definitions of, of betting and, and gambling compared to investing they are, are very very diff different definitions but you know i treat it very much as investing treat it like a business and expect that anyone who's a member is doing the same yeah that's fair that makes perfect sense the Betfair Exchange isn't a house that sets the odds. It's betting at its purest. One punter's opinion against another's. Play the game within the game at betfair.com.au. Gamble responsibly. On the investing side, I was curious to listen to some of your public thoughts from a while ago now, but talking about investing, and it seems like that was part of the impetus for winning edge investments, and people like... Warren Buffett from Berkshire and, and Ray Dalio from Bridgewater. What are some of those guiding principles you've sort of gathered along the way? And you've touched on some of them, but from the investing side more so that you've been able to translate to sports and horse racing. Yeah, I, I love reading about, about successful investors and particularly around you know, not only the methodologies that they use, but also the mindset uh, because that's so uh, so critical to success in any type of investing and i think you know you've only got to look at what's happening in, in, in certain markets i was reading about amazon you know everybody knows the amazon business you know their share price at one point was 113 dollars. it went down to five dollars 97 and it's now 1362 dollars. i think on, on last look uh, the current share price you know a successful investor who's, who's, who's backing themselves you know knows sort of when to hold and, and, and when to, you know, just continue to back their judgment, I suppose. Whereas the, the vast majority of people simply sell and panic during during a down period. And, you know, there was very interesting analysis that had been done multiple times on hedge funds and, and uh, funds that invest on behalf of sort of what you call mum and dad investors. And what they found is that the actual results that people, uh, you know, mum and dad investors achieve compared to the results 
that are that are actually achieved by these hedge funds is significantly reduced, and that's because uh, because of the emotion side of it. The uh, the mum and dad investors panic and, and sell when things are going down, then buy once they've gone up again. Um, and uh, you know, another great example is Bitcoin. <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it's probably out of um, out of the scope of this discussion around you know the future and the virtues of, of cryptocurrencies. But what I find interesting around Bitcoin is again. You know, it shot up to fifty dollars and then dropped to fifteen. It, it shot up to two hundred and fifty dollars and dropped to fifty. Once it got to eleven hundred dollars, it dropped to one hundred and eighty-five dollars. And as we know now, it's you know fifteen thousand. Or you know, by the time we finished talking, it might have dropped to thirteen and bounced up to seventeen. All the matter could be anything. Time, but what's interesting now is uh, when, when I look at cryptos, is that a lot of people, uh, you know, in the racing industry have gotten into that space. And, and what's interesting is they've they've almost changed their mindset. They sort of the, the smart ones at least know that that crypto and it, it's sort of almost become you know people are accustomed to it that it's going to bounce up and down and up and down and up and down and if you have this uh, belief uh, and a lot of them have a very firm belief that it is going to keep going up and up and at least for a, a, a fair while to come then they're not they're not bothered by by those massive swings and I suppose you know the reason for for me going on about this is that I have the same perspective when it comes to, to betting I know that I'm going to win long term, and I'm not bothered by any sort of uh, short term variance. But what you what you come to learn, you know, in running uh, these sorts of uh, tipping services is is that people have a tendency to drop off during a down period, and, and, a, and a tendency to hop on after a big, you know, uh, winning run, yep. uh, and then wonder why they're not achieving those results. And I guess what what I have tried to do, and will continue to try to do with winning edge investments, is say to people. It, it's all, it's about time in the market rather than trying to time the market. If you subscribe to our services, you know these are highly successful, you know, expert analysts or you know, uh, full-time professional punters who you can trust and rely on. You know, our services, you know, we do everything right in terms of trying to ensure the results are achievable and and everything's open and transparent. And if a service isn't performing and we we don't have the faith long term that it will, then then we we terminate. Uh, you know because there's there's absolutely no benefit in our business in having a losing service. Not only does income not come in because of the profit guarantees, but it also drags down the portfolios of everyone. So we're very quick to act yeah. if a service is uh, you know doesn't have the you know isn't adding any value to what I would call the overall portfolio. But you know if if you look at Warren Buffett. $58 billion net worth, one of the richest men in the world. He actually started as a, a horse racing handicapper. Uh, from learning how to price a horse, he then moved to pricing companies and stocks. You know, And, and Warren made a fortune being contrarian, backing his own opinion. Uh, and it's the same in the racing game. You need to back your own opinion. Respect the market, but, but don't let it over-influence you because uh, you need to be contrarian and you need to back your opinion. Uh, if, if you don't, then you, you're not going to win simply following the market. Uh, you know, there's a few other quotes of his that I, I just find interesting that you can you can sort of relay back back to racing or well, betting in general. You know, he's made the comments before that derivatives are financial weapons of mass destruction, you know, CFDs and options, that sort of thing. But I suppose the punting equivalent of derivatives are exotics, you know, uh, quinillas, trifectas, and quaddies, which you can absolutely make a profit from. But if, if you're not making a good profit on your win and place betting, you're unlikely to do so with those. Uh, you know, he talks about understanding risk, drawdown. You know, it's about using a mathematically sound bank protection strategies. Uh, he's made the quote, our favorite holding period is forever. <laughs> I guess, you know that's that that's again uh, you know what I'm speaking about the longer term perspective you take the more successful you will be uh, and he's also said I have no idea on timing it's easy to tell what will happen rather than when it will happen uh, and it's so you know the largest global betting syndicates in the world they, they don't know when they're winning or losing periods will be they just know they will win overall and I guess that's that's the message that that we try to continue to convey to our members uh, and, and to anyone who's who's interested is that you know the you can make outstanding uh, money from from betting on horses and uh, you can do it in a way that uh, you know you can because of the power of compound and can grow your betting bank significantly quicker than than you can with alternative forms of investment you know if you've got if you've got a ten thousand dollar betting bank if you chuck it in a, in a bank you're, you're lucky to maybe make three percent. Uh, you know Warren Buffett himself. You know he makes twenty percent per year on on stocks. So unless you back yourself to be better than Warren Buffett, uh, you're going to struggle to do twenty percent. But the, the difference with betting on horse racing or sport is is that you're constantly turning over. 
you're constantly turning that bank over. So rather than just investing a static $10,000 at the beginning of the year, you're turning that $10,000 over. So although you only need 10000 you might be turning that over you know, to 100000 or or a million over a year. And at, at the end of the day, you know, if you're constantly turning that over at, at say, that $10,000, you're turning over $100,000 in a year and you're only making 10%, we've actually made a $10,000 profit. And that's a 100% return on your yeah. bank rather than 20%. It's that simple concept is where the, the great potential in, in betting on racing or sport is. Uh, you know, so if you if you do have an edge uh, and you take a long-term perspective, then that is uh, that is what can be achieved. So have you thought about doing things to help your investors, uh, you know, save them from themselves, for want of a better term, in terms of perhaps like minimum subscriptions, which obviously probably from a PR perspective may not come across great, but... Things like that where you can not only tell them but try and save them from themselves or have you just said, look, we're going to provide you with all the tools, all the content and then ultimately if you want to treat it like a, a mum and dad might treat their investment portfolio and opt in and out at the wrong times based on panic, um, that's for them to decide. Yeah, look, I mean, I mean the first thing that we've tried to do is, is educate uh, and educate and educate and educate and try to have people hold the answer in their hands. Yeah, one thing we we did do when we merged was we removed weekly memberships. Yeah, uh, and, and I find it interesting that you know a lot of others in the game have, have in fact done the opposite and, and only offer weekly memberships, which to me is again antith- antithetical to the concept of trying to you know succeed with your betting long term. So at the moment we only offer monthly, quarterly, or yearly subscriptions. I have I have given a lot of consideration to to removing the the, the monthly subscription. Okay. And there's, there's other business models that we've considered and we'll continue to consider, you know, whether we, we lump all services together in, in, into one and sort of have a one uh, group of uh, services, you know, that, that people follow under under the one price and, and you know, r- really treat it sort of as, as one big investment like that. To diversify? Yeah, yeah, sort of in, ensuring that diversification and, and then just ensuring that, uh, you know, all of the services that are, that are in that group are, are highly profitable and, and, and pulling their weight, you know, that's one way. There's other methods uh, around potentially, you know, charging based on the actual profit achieved, and not not charging if if a profit's not achieved. At the moment, the the difficulty with that is just the the mechanics of it, um, and the the admin I suppose required. Yeah. Catching people, you know, I'd like to do something like that, but it's just it's just an administration nightmare, I think. Uh, so you know, at, at the moment for us, it's it's about doing the right things, uh, educating people. And just you know, ensuring that we remain you know the trusted provider uh, of these services, and, and that people know that our best interests are at heart, and, and they have to be because our entire business model is based on success. Uh, and if we don't succeed, uh, we don't get anything. So you know, at the moment, that's that's the focus. And for me, you know, my passion is really just about educating people. Uh, it can be hard to to stay the course. It can be hard to you know hold on when when, when things are going down. And I think. I think the difficulty that people have, you know, if you if you buy crypto and you kind of just leave it there and you you don't kind of look at it, it, it's easy to ignore it when it's going up and down to a degree. I think what people struggle with is when you're betting, you're there every day, you're placing the bets. So you know, there, there's a bit more you know every daily effort required. I, mean, I don't really call it effort because I enjoy it. Uh, you know, both the challenge of getting the best price, but also, you know, there's a lot more enjoyment of sitting there and watching the races and, and, and cheering the horses, uh, enjoying the process more than just sitting and, and watching a number go up and down on the screen. But, you know, I think your Ray Dalio, another one of his quotes was, was do the hard things, the reward is bigger. And, uh, you know, that's a fundamental law of nature. You have to do difficult things to gain strength and power. That's called perturbation. It's how a rock or carbon becomes diamond. It's, you know, like pushing your, yourself hard at the gym. If, if doing something difficult brings benefits from doing it, you sort of look forward to doing it. And, you know, that might mean putting twice as much effort into, you know, reviewing half the number of races or, you know, spending time getting the best possible prices or, you know, whatever it is. But, uh, you know, life tends to reward those who, who, who stay the course uh, and back themselves. Uh, and, you know, at the end of the day, it's that, that simple concept of value. If you're getting odds greater than a horse's true chance of winning, then you can't possibly lose in the long term. Uh, and that's that's really what I try to focus on personally, uh, and that's what I try to e- educate people to do. You know, whether they're following services or whether they're betting for themselves, that's that's just the critical the critical element. So you mentioned before a little bit about 
the power of sort of compound and what your bankroll can do with you know turning over money you know a number of times and repetition of bets and things like that what is some of the guiding principles for your money management and what things have you put in place to ensure solid money management look you've got to start with a betting bank uh, uh you know that 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 that's first that's the first point uh in the, in the same way that you'll say i'll i'm going to put x amount in in the bank or i'm going to put x amount into shares uh or crypto or your property or whatever it is that you wanting to invest you need to have a set amount uh and, and say this is how much i want to bet we we convert the betting bank into units uh and utilize a, a 100 unit betting bank uh so you know if you if you have ten thousand dollars then then you're betting 100 dollars per unit uh and and what you've got to do you know some people have uh, yeah, I wouldn't ever recommend anything less than a hundred unit betting bank. Some people are, are more conservative and have a two hundred unit betting bank. You know that that has some merit as well. And some people like to sort of bet five percent, the bank four percent. Those sorts of numbers um, are generally around what what's advised and are similar to sort of hedge funds investing. You know, somewhere between two to four percent of 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 their total uh, investment portfolio on any one. Uh, trade or investment, but yeah, it's it sort of it, 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 the concept's essentially that the hundred unit betting bank, and then and then betting generally, you know, somewhere between zero point five to three percent on any one bet or any one horse, and and it's really about minimising your risk and and minimising the risk of uh, depleting your bank to nothing, whilst not uh, whilst trying to maximise your return as well. And there's always that balance in any type of investment between minimising risk and, and maximising uh, reward. If you bet too little you don't get enough uh, value out of it but if you bet too much then you risk blowing your entire bank uh, and, and so our philosophy with all of our services is exactly the same it's always the 100 unit betting bank uh, it's always the you know the yields record in exactly the same manner they're, they're easily comparable but also that people really understand exactly uh, how to use it and it's sort of a, a i suppose it's a, a version of of the kelly criterion that's definitely the concept uh, that we use you know something like a, a sort of a quarter Kelly equivalent, uh, but but not exactly. It, it's really uh, you know trying to balance uh, you know the fact and the, the respect that we have that that uh, you know we are responsible for you know the, the the banks, the betting banks, and 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 the investing of of a large number of clientele. So so you know balancing that risk and reward is is what's critically important, and that's uh, that's why we have these measures in place. And what about recalculating your bank? How often would you do that back to the sort of so if you've got a hundred units and they're a dollar each, and then you get to a thousand dollars, let's say, do you when do you recalculate? Is it daily, weekly, monthly? How do you f- think about that sort of uh, approach? Yeah, it's a very good question. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of material on this, and there's a lot of opposing opinions. I know a lot of successful punters who do it daily, and others who do it yearly. My advice to members is is to do it. Probably no more often than every six months or so. I think. I think for one thing, you, in terms of simplicity, uh, particularly when you're following services, you know, you, you don't want to be trying to do bizarre calculations on on how much to invest. Uh, you know, if you've got a ten thousand dollar betting bank and someone's selling you a better unit, and you know that's a hundred dollar bet, that's nice and simple. But if you're constantly having to recalculate that and the bet's one point two five units in your in your banks. 12,100 and you're trying to do this mass all the time before you put a bet on it's uh you know not all that productive i, I think the other problem with with daily is uh you know we all know the volatility um in betting uh you know there, there's swings and roundabouts all of the time and, and and the challenge is often that you know you go through a losing run and your bank is depleted and then suddenly when you have the inevitable winning run you're having less on the horses because because you're using you know, let's say your bank's gone from ten thousand to five thousand dollars. Suddenly, you're only betting half, so it takes double the effort to yeah. uh, uh, to get your bank back. So, so I, I advise members to look at it. You know, every six months, even a year. For me personally, I actually do it each year. Um, I sort of uh, you know reset. And go okay, what am I going to uh, attack with this year? And uh, and I don't reset through the year. I um, uh, I stick with that through the year. It's it's, it's easier to follow. And uh, and it's easier to plan for all potential outcomes and uh, and requirements through the year that way. So uh, there's a lot of theories on it. I'm I'm not totally you know I, I don't believe in necessarily a right way or a wrong way. A lot of it depends on people's personal situation and what they're comfortable with. But you know I, I would look at I would look at adjusting probably every six months or so rather than trying to do it daily unless you uh, unless you're comfortable with doing those calculations consistently. 
What about multiple banks? I've heard some people say they have multiple banks and they have different approaches for those, depending on different you know forms of Cali and maybe even different periods of recalculation. Have you ever delved into anything like that? I've I've done a lot of, uh, and, and in the members' information pack, there's a lot of detail around my thoughts on whether you should have one bank for multiple services or separate banks. Uh, and I'm I'm certainly of the belief that. For each service that you're following, you should have a, a separate bank for that. And, and the issue that you have when when you've got one bank for multiple services, if, firstly, if you've got you know a ten thousand dollar bank, but you're betting on three services, but you're betting a hundred dollars a unit, you're, you're automatically actually uh, have cut your your betting bank in, in three. Which means if if one of the services fails and has a significant losing run, um, you can lose the entire betting bank despite the others performing well. Uh, and, you know the other the other issue is just you know around diversification. If if you have one betting bank for multiple services, you're actually not diversifying, uh, despite the fact that you think you might be, because you only need one very very poorly performed service to drag you know your entire bank down. Whereas if you've got if you're following five services uh, and you've got five separate betting banks, uh, and if you've only got ten thousand dollars, you might have a two thousand dollar betting bank for each service. But at least if you do that, if you have one terrible terrible service that you're following that doesn't deliver at least it doesn't bring your whole bank down it only brings a portion of your bank down so in terms of diversification i'm certainly a big uh, proponent of of having separate banks for every service rather than trying to merge everything into one that's interesting i haven't really found any good content online or maybe i'm looking in the wrong places so that's it's fascinating that you've covered that deeply in your package you provide to the members that's very interesting you see the numbers you want more control on the Betfair Exchange, you can back, lay, trade, and set your own odds. So join the world's largest peer-to-peer -peer betting platform. Get into the game within the game at betfair.com.au. Gamble responsibly. I want to talk about your your trial watching expert. So I want to delve into that. We touched on it earlier, and I guess take us through when you had sort of the the most edge earlier on uh, when you were watching trials. Take us through what you would watch what you were looking for, how you would, you know, what notes you would make, things like that, and how that's evolved to now and what that edge is like now. Yeah, uh, you know, in terms of um, what you look for in trials, I think the, the first thing is the time. You know, the time's very important. I, I've sort of gone from, you know, using the times that were available just on, you know, the Racing New South Wales or Racing Victoria, the various websites, uh, coming to the realisation that they weren't always accurate to so doing my own timing, uh, coming to the realization that that was uh, very time consuming, so I moved to uh, Vince Accardi's stuff for a while, uh, and then yeah, at the moment uh, I now use um, the the ratings to win access database. Uh, and what I like about that, uh, and the reason that I prefer it to all others, is it, it compares the trial times to a par, rather than uh, you know seeing a raw time. You know, so I sort of got to a point where raw time isn't that important to me. I've not really got any interest in that it's really just how quick or slow was it compared to the average or par time that's usually run in those trials and, and the time the raw time and against pars one element of it but what's also very important is simply comparing those uh, those times on the same day because uh, you tend to find you know, whether it's wet or dry track conditions or the way the wind's blowing or the various how far the rail is out and all these sorts of things can have a big impact on the times so and comparing times of trials across Trials run on different days is actually quite problematic and, and difficult. It can be done with the, the par times to a degree, but you know, the first thing is just comparing. You usually have, you know, uh, uh, on those big trials, certainly the ones at, at Rose Hill and, and Cranbourne and all those trial tracks usually have, you know, 10 or 12 trials over the same distance. So you can do a lot of comparison firstly on, on times. And, and then the second thing is, you know, I actually do the form for trials in the same way that most people do the form for races. So I'm actually looking at the horses, the class of the, the horses, uh, you know, who's on board the trainer, the stage of their preparation, and almost have a, you know, in, in my mind, I'm, I'm going through and, and, and working out what I think the finishing order should be. Uh, and, and then it's having a look and, uh, at the outcomes, and when you when you're looking at the trials, and you've got some open class horses, some horses have won a few country races, and you might have some maidens in there, uh, you know, two and three year olds. Uh, it's about how should they be how should they be competing, uh, and obviously you get very excited when you see a, a maiden or, or a young horse who's, who's jog trotting along, a, a far more experienced and and successful horse, and that horse might be under hard riding, and certainly when they've run time, uh, then you you know you've got a horse that's got a lot of potential uh, coming up. 
uh, you know, for me, you, you got to look very closely at what the jockeys are doing. You can see the jockeys that are that are hard riding. Uh, you know, their, their forearms are under pressure, or they've got the horse under the stick, and they're really trying to get the best out of the horse. Uh, then you've got some situation where the jockeys aren't really pushing the horse out, but aren't restraining it either. Uh, it's just sort of letting the horse jog trot under its own steam. Uh, and then you've got the situations where you can see the rider, uh, you know, almost like he's uh, trying to pull up a weight. Uh, it, his hands are locked tight, uh, and he's trying to to pull the horse up. And obviously, in those situations, when you can see the horse is uh, still making ground on the, on the leaders, or uh, you know, jog trotting up next to others that are hard ridden, that's where you know you've got a horse that certainly has a lot more to give. And so those it's those sorts of things that you're looking at, as well as the action of the horse. You know, is the horse move freely in its action you know does it look like like it's gliding across without any issues you know did it jump well all that sort of thing so it can put itself in a position in a race uh you, you know you find there's a lot of um uh, horses that are quite you know, unruly or erratic uh, and, and then what you want to do is take notes on those and see if they improve their manners over time and sometimes the ones that improve their manners are the ones that have uh, their race performances and improve sharply you know, a good example recently with my trial spice service about uh, in mid-December, advised members to take uh, $34 about sunlight for the, the Magic Millions. Uh, and that was on the back of watching it run a, a Gold Coast trial where it not only ran a time that was 10 lengths above par, but what was interesting was it, uh, it was basically jog-trotting on the inside of a horse that was ridden out called uh, Outback Barbie that then came out and um, won a listed race on debut. And it was straight after it won that listed race on debut that I, I, I sent the information to members and said $34 about sunlight for the Magic Millions is outrageous. The source, uh, you know, is absolutely jog trotting next to a listed winner. Uh, it's looked like it's come back incredibly strong and it just needs to win a race to qualify. And that's it. Uh, and and as, um, as most will recall, sunlight ended up bolting in the Magic Millions, started uh, you know, $3.80 favorite. And that was a fantastic result. But it's that sort of thing that you can see early. Uh, you know, Zoo Star is another one that I remember before the Golden Rose that I advised members to to bet in futures about a month before fifteen dollars because again, as a young horse, it was uh, running in trials, you know, hard held uh, alongside uh, a black type performers. So yeah, it's those sort of trials that that excite me, and uh, and that's what you're looking for is those horses with a lot of potential. You know, particularly when they're going to the weaker races, maidens and that sort of thing to start off with, and. Um, and uh, and you know that uh, they're going to blow them away, but you can also follow them successfully through their careers because they've got uh, they've got that potential. Dan, you're going to get a lot of people banned if you keep providing thirty four dollars about sunlight. So uh, just keep that in mind, please. <laughs> I'm aware. You hear about horses like Piero, I believe, who apparently wasn't very good in trialing, if my memory recalls me correctly. Is do you find those sort of horses as well? And if if it is a, a really good horse who just trials poorly or looks terrible, how long does it take to form sort of a an alternate opinion about something that is doing those type of characteristic trials? Yeah, it, it can be tricky. Uh, and there's certain trainers whose horses, I suppose, run up to their trials. There's other trainers whose horses trial like absolute superstars, I guess, trial like Tarzan, run like Jane sort of thing. Yep. Uh, um, and, uh, and then there's some that, you know their horses just don't appear to trial well at all. They're always under hard riding. What I've what I've learned over time is that some of those trainers, you know, they put the the heavy boots or shoes on the horses. Uh, you know, even the jockeys have got a lot of weight on. Um, and I, I don't. Sometimes it might be because they're wanting to put a bet on the horse later, but it, I don't think it's always as, as nefarious as that. It's sometimes just that the, the, the trainers like that sort of methodology of uh, the horse carrying a big weight and, and having those heavy shoes on and then going to the race and, you know, feeling all, all light and ready to go. You know, I know Peter Moody was sort of like that. Uh, the Snowdens are a bit like that. Uh, and I'm finding more recently Brad Wood is, is one whose horses don't trial anywhere, at least on face value, don't trial anywhere as well as they race. Now those trainers are fantastic to follow if you can if you can pick up on that because the, the, their horses tend to be far greater odds than the ones who have trialed to the naked eye you know uh, more impressively and so that's that's where the the art of it comes in and and you know there's the science of the data and the times and and that sort of thing but there's there's also a real art around understanding how the different trainers trial their horses and and how they look you know the, the gay waterhouse ones don't always. Uh, look as impressive because you rise them out hard and most people in trials are trying to look for the ones that are hard held 
uh, you know, jogging, but, you know, all of hers are given a very steady workout. But, you know, again, in the case of Gay and, and Peter Snowden, these sorts of trainers, the horses really come on from the trials and, uh, and, and tend to continue to improve uh, substantially heading into the races, whereas I think there's other trainers whose horses are already fully wound up for the trial and then they look very impressive, but they get to race time and they've already done their done their dash or well, they're simply just, just massive unders because they've been trialling well, but uh, you know, there's others that have a lot more improvement. So it's an art. It's a very difficult thing to sort of sit here and explain, explain simply, but, uh, you know, it's it's like anything. If you find your niche and you focus on it and you do it over a long period, you know, the, the Malcolm Gladwell theory of 10,000 hours, then you just kind of uh, build a bit of a gut instinct on these things and, and, and uh, end, up, end up working with that and, and trusting that through the process. So take us through your Saturday or a race day. Once you've done all your form, you've looked at the trials, you've done your additional form on top of that, what does it look like for you? Are you just sticking to what your form says and betting accordingly? And are you accounting for the bias of the track? Take us through what you do on a race-to-race basis on a Saturday afternoon, for example. Yeah, well, Saturday is often mayhem. Um uh, you know, I mean, I've got I've got the two services, Trial Spy and, and Data Spy. So the, the, the Trial Spy is entirely on uh, the trial form and the trial analysis, and then and then Data Spy is, uh, you know, based on my assessment of uh, you know the ratings to win in database access and, and speed ratings and, and and compiling sort of ratings on horses and, and identifying the big value there. So yeah, the first thing I'm doing, I suppose, bang on 9 a.m. The first thing I'm doing is sending the information out to members. And then I'm looking myself at the, at the markets and, and, and getting any early bets on where there's significant value. Uh, through the day, I have a tendency, you know, I bet more on do all of my analysis and then and then focus on the key horses that I want to back. And sometimes in a race, there might be a, a, a strategy. You know, we're backing two or three horses, and so you know, I might I might back one early and then and then look late for the others. But I tend these days to very much stick with. Uh, my opinion, yeah, I do an enormous amount of hard work, uh, you know, every day, in order to form the opinions that I have, um, and I think it goes back to, uh, you know, the quotes from from Warren Buffett and the like, where you know you've got to be contrary and have your own opinion, uh, and I've seen some some winners drift to, to crazy prices. You know, we had one uh, for the Data Spy service that was, that was 100 to one when I gave it out, and ended up drifting out to as much as 560 dollars on Betfair. Uh, and won a horse called Emma D. You know, now if you let the market uh, convince you that the horse can't win when it gets out to 560 to 1, then you've missed out on, on an enormous opportunity. So I've found the, especially these days, you know, the market enormously overreacts. Uh, wow. You know, we see it in, in, in cricket. It's an example where, you know, a big bash you're watching and, and those prices fluctuate up and down based on a wicket or uh, that sort of thing. I've, I find racing the, Markets are massively overbetting by the end of it, particularly favourites. You know, there's some short price favourites that just get down to crazy odds, and, and the rest of them drift. And they're not drifting because there's something wrong with them. They're just drifting because of the the market forces of the money on on the favourite or one or two horses. And you know, these days, uh, that market is controlled by a fairly small set of very substantial punters uh, and betting syndicates, who more or less a lot of them have the same opinion anyway. What I have become quite good at is is assessing what I think the market will do compared to you know, what I think the market should be uh, in terms of you know trying to trying to determine what those big syndicates uh, are likely to bet on uh, you know the robots as some call them uh, you know but where they're most likely to focus and then determining you know whether the drift is simply because of uh, you know the market backing the horses as expected or not. Yeah, certainly track bars is something that, that comes into it in a big way. I mean, it's, it's probably my, my biggest frustration uh, is the, the track bias prevalent at the moment. I know there's a lot of different opinions on this, but I, I actually come from the, you know, the roots, I suppose, of the fact that I love horse racing. And one thing that I loved about horse racing is, is watching horses you know, come from the back and, and charge home. And you see it in a lot of countries, you know, in New Zealand certainly happens. You know, Hong Kong has a big straight where it happens a lot. Uh, in the UK, you know, horses can win from anywhere. What seems to be happening in Australia is, and it's not necessarily the, the fault of, of track managers, but you know, the tracks are just so rock hard uh, and they're so tightly uh, turning in, in a lot of these smaller tracks that uh, horses just can't win from the back. And I, I find that racing... Uh, 
I just find it boring. And you know, I know a lot of people from betting perspective saying, "Well, it's easy. You just you just back horses that are on pace and that sort of thing." And certainly, that's a, 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 a huge uh, uh, edge. It's, it's simply focusing on horses on pace. But you know, I I, I still love to to go down to Flemington every year and enjoy watching the Melbourne Cup Carnival. Uh, you know, it's, I think it's the best racing in the world. I just absolutely love it. But uh, when you've got you know huge fields of sixteen, all you want is for the horses to have the ability to come from out wide and swoop. And I've found in, in recent years that that's becoming less and less prevalent, even at a big track like Flemington. So, uh, you know, I'm I'm finding the enjoyment of watching those huge races a lot less when it's actually more about the map and, and who can get into the decent spot rather than uh, who, who's the best horse and every char- every horse having a, a reasonable, even an opportunity to win. Uh, and we're finding a lot of a lot of races these days, horses just don't have the opportunity to win now from a betting perspective understand you can take advantage of that uh, by doing your maps well uh, but as a racing lover it's probably my my key bugbear at the moment is is just that the tracks aren't being prepared to give the horses and therefore the owners and, and the punters every chance on, on actually backing the best horse uh, and i hope it's something that that the industry looks into because i i i, I certainly know that you, you rank and file punters who fund the industry they do like to see swoopers i like to see horses having their chance uh, and they don't just want to see a procession of leaders on the rails winning all the time. So, you know, that's something, I guess, getting back to the point of your question. Uh, yes, you know, if, if there's a significant track bias and, that, and I'm on something that, uh, you know, might need a bit of a, a back market, then I will look at adjusting my, my bet, whether that's as, uh, smaller or, you know, eliminating it entirely. Uh, you, 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 can't, uh, you can't ignore that. But you've got to be careful not to overcompensate as well because it's quite interesting how often there can be a, a prevalent track bias for the first sort of six or seven races on the day and the last one or two it actually goes the complete opposite way because all the jockeys go silly up hard in front uh set a you know suicidal pace and and, and then uh, they win from the back at the end so uh it's all part of it but you know uh, to, to sort of summarize i put in so much work at the beginning that i generally tend to uh, you know stick with that and, and there's the the ups and downs that go with, with track bars and, and things changing through the day but i generally stick with my process and find long term again that uh there's swings and roundabouts but but long term it's fine poor old chautauqua could have been anything with uh favorable tracks in australia well i think he's done a pretty amazing job with uh, uh with with his style but uh, i guess when you look you know most of his success has been at randwick which uh you know for the most part is a, a pretty fair track um, and you know, down the down the straight at Flemington, those sorts of things. But uh, uh, yeah, he's a he's a he's an absolute superstar, and I think people people really love that style of racing. Uh, you know, they really do, and and you want to just you want those horses to at least have a reasonable chance. We all understand that that, that on paces win most races, and, and you know, uh, uh, there can be reasonably slow tempos in in Australia, so uh, they're going to be favoured, but. Uh, yeah, what what frustrates me is when a horse hooks out wide and that's essentially quicksand and the horse just can't possibly win. Yeah, and, and you know, or there's a rails bias. It's that sort of thing that just needs to be stamped out because it just it's not racing anymore. It's just nonsense. Well, even Winks had an element in the beginning. Certainly, I remember the Sunshine Coast race, which most people probably remember, which started off the win mm-hmm. streak, I believe, or was one of the the earlier races where she just went crazy down the outside and you don't see too many of those uh, not consistently anyway so it's an interesting thought it certainly uh it, it certainly made people still wake up and, and think this this source might be something special you know on winks i think it's it's one of the things that people enjoy about the trials by service we actually back winks at its first two starts and, and uh you know by no means identified that it would become the champion it was but uh, you could see from its early trials that there was definitely something there in terms of an engine, and, and they gave her a couple of quiet trials, but yeah, the little bit that they tested her out, she, she showed something. And, you know, horses like Winx and Chautauqua and, and Red Zell uh, and a lot of these high-quality horses, Zoo Star and, and most Gold Slipper winners, you know, horses that from the trials by service we've identified, you know, early on in their careers. And I think that's something that, you know, I get a lot of enjoyment from too, you know, is identifying them early and then following them through their careers. But certainly that's where the trial stuff, uh, you know, gives you, um, you know, a different sort of edge and, and perspective and uh, uh, an opportunity. So before we finish up, I want to go back to winning edge investments for a minute. Who do you suggest, based on what you've said, I think I know what the answer is, but who do you suggest signs up to, to your service and services? Are you only looking for those with a long-term sort of investment strategy and, and people who are using those types of words who want to be in it for a long haul and 
and you know eke out 10 12 14 16 percent or whatever it is and and align their investment goals with that is that sort of your target yeah absolutely i mean you you need to be prepared to be disciplined you need to be prepared to have a betting bank uh yeah you know one thing's about one thing about sort of i guess the 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 tipping industry and the services is you need to balance uh you know the membership numbers uh, you know, and we don't do that by ensuring that we're priced in a way that that we're not flooding ourselves with a ridiculous number of members. You know, there's certainly a lot of services that have far more members than us, but we we deliberately keep it, uh, you know, to a restricted level. And you know, we'll close services and have done plenty of times if um, if we're going over membership numbers or we're seeing any issues with with prices. So you know, we're we're not out there desperate for the maximum number of members. In fact, we're quite the opposite because the success of our existing members um, and of members in the future is imperative because uh, we're in it for the long haul. And what's also very important, of course, is that you know, our analysts are doing it for a living, uh, and betting themselves, so they can't afford to uh, you know have, have prices um, you know disappearing or, or crucified. So, uh, you know, we, we are looking for people with a long-term perspective. We're looking for people that, uh, you know, are interested in, in treating it like an investment um, and, and understand the ups and downs and, and, you know, want to be educated. You know, I sort of go back to, you know, myself in, in that, uh, you know, I was I knew that I was good at, at finding winners and, and, and betting on uh, and, and, you know, finding uh, uh, good value, but I was still losing a lot on the punt until I learnt about uh, you know the mindset side of things and, and setting a bank and, and being disciplined uh, and, and using the various you know money management sort of strategies um, that, that we advocate so you know for me it's, it's anyone who's interested in this long term and I guess has the mindset of me of hey you know I, I love racing or I love sport I'm going to bet on it uh, you know you've either got the option of trying to not bet at all um, or you may as well make some money from it and enjoy it uh, and I guess that's uh, you know that's what um, that's what we focus on is, is, is people with that sort of mindset, but that understand that uh, you know that's not going to come from uh, one big win, and it's not going to come from winning every single day or every single week or even every single month. But the, you're going to have the ups and downs in the same way that all the biggest companies in the world, Apple, Amazon, Google, you know, even Bitcoin, that's gone up from you know. Five cents to to fifteen thousand dollars, and they all have bigs up and ups and downs. You know, we have our swings up and down too. But you know, if you look at the results graphs overall of our services, they're going up, uh, and if they don't, they're removed. So, you know, that that's the mindset. It's that investment mindset. And if you have that, or you want to learn how to get that, th- then you're probably suitable. And if you're not, uh, and you're just wanting to sort of have you know, twenty or fifty bucks on uh, uh, on a Saturday. Yeah, there might be other other services that are more suitable. So, how do listeners get in contact with you, or what, what's the website for them and the Twitter handle? So, if they are interested, they can certainly reach out. Their website is uh, www.winningedgeinvestments.com. My Twitter handle is at Dean Charles By. The Twitter handle of uh, of us is at Winning Edge Bets. And yeah, you know, you're welcome to take a look at the website. There's plenty of information there. We've got all of the membership options, the results. A lot of educational material on there, uh, and we've also got a free newsletter. So you're welcome to simply sign up there or contact us with any questions uh, about how we operate. And uh, you know, certainly this year, I've already spoken to all of the analysts, and this year is going to be where we really focus on providing a lot more uh, educational content about how we do things, how how each of the services go about things. We've got quite a diverse range of services. You know, one that focuses on on New South Wales, uh, one that focuses entirely on video watching and black booking horses one who's entirely around uh, pedigree and actual pedigree analysis uh, to identify winners uh, and and one who's uh, built his, his own uh, proprietary database uh, and then actually had a, a phd sort of data quant person come in and, and analyze it and build a model uh, you know to provide very select bets only when the the, the market price is substantially above his rated price and uh, you know that's running at 24 percent profit on turnover at the moment been 170 units in about four months been quite incredible uh, a golf service that's tipped to a thousand to one winner and a few sort of 500 to one winners uh, and a cricket service that's uh, been very highly successful as well so there's a, there's a wide range uh, but each have their own niche uh, and, and their own edge and i guess it's about you know what service suits you and and, and that can depend on what you what you like to bet on but also the, the, the bookies you have available or you know whether you want to just bet and forget or whether you can monitor prices that sort of thing but you know if you get in touch with us we can we can help to advise you of the the service or services that are best suited to uh, each person if you like the content approach and strategy of dean 
please feel free to head over to winningedgeinvestments.com, check out their site, products, and of course, subscribe to their newsletter. And feel free to utilize code BOBPOD. Awesome, Dean. It's been incredibly fun. I really appreciate your time. I'll certainly be keeping a close eye on, and uh, I wish you and the team all the very best, and I look forward to doing this again another time. Yeah, thank you, Jake. I appreciate uh, appreciate your time and, and what you're doing with this podcast. It's absolutely fantastic. I've really loved uh, listening to you know all of the uh, the professionals and, and experts in the different spheres. Um, and uh, you know you've got uh, what I believe is the, the, you know the the, uh, the foremost primary uh, podcast now on this topic that uh, was something that wasn't available anywhere. But uh, you've you've got some fantastic guests on there, and I encourage everybody to to, to because you know for me, educating people on on betting and and the potential success is, is critical because I love racing. Uh, but it's it's reliant on on betting and and, and racing certainly is under pressure from sports betting and and other uh, uh, other forms of investment. Uh, so you know we need to keep educating people and keep them interested to to keep this game going. So uh, please keep it up. You're doing a fantastic job. Much appreciated, and, and definitely let's do this again soon. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Jake.